We are happy to have Professor Anish Zuchi here. Uh, Dr. Zuchi is an assistant professor at uh, Nova School of Science and Technology, the Nova FCT, and specializing in entrepreneurship, digital platforms, and emerging <coughs> digital technologies. He has a vast experience in designing and implementing entrepreneurial educational uh, programs which combines technology application with entrepreneurial team building. And he is coordinating uh, the annual course on entrepreneurship at the Faculty of Science and Technology at the University Nova de Lisboa, which involves 1,000 students taking the course in multidisciplinary teams. And he is also coordinating executive programs such as Samsung Innovation Artificial Intelligence, FinTech Innovation, and a course on blockchain technologies living in decentralized world, that is the name of uh, that course, at Nova Execute, Executive Education. So thank you, Professor Zuchi, for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. So uh, I'll try to keep this lecture not too heavy, but after this lecture, you have a task to do, and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Professor Rashin will later uh, will explain. But I believe that's uh, contributing to their uh, evaluation, right? Right. Right. So. So that's a task, but that's an entrepreneurial task, as uh, Professor Sheen said, that I am a professor mostly focusing on digital entrepreneurship. And I see quite a lot of mixed, uh, mixed faces here. You're probably from different backgrounds. I'd like to know a little bit uh, more about you. But are there any entrepreneurs here? Anyone started a business, has a family business? Anyone has a family business? Okay. What, what, what family business you have? Yeah, building sector. Building sector? Construction? Yes, but I'm not consider myself in Okay. Well, if, you have, if you're working for yourself, in a way you are, you are an entrepreneur. But we are, we are talking about, our focus today will be more on digital entrepreneurship. And uh, it will be linked to the assignment that you've done. You've just done a credit risk scoring assignment. So we're going to be applying that. To, to the concept of entrepreneurship. But when we talk of digital entrepreneurship, it, we cannot talk that without talking about digital disruption, right? Uh, just uh, before I want to have an idea, how many of the students, uh, I want to know a little bit about the, your nationalities. How many are Portuguese? Just raise your hand, I, I'd say, okay. How many are not Portuguese here? Okay, so I, uh, I, I want to know, some, which are the nationalities covered? Where are you? Angola. Angola and who else? Uh, Spain. Spain. India. India. And Austria. Austria. Okay. Did we miss anyone? Okay. So we have we have quite an international class. <laughs> quite quite interesting here. So um, let's let's see. Okay, so we're going to talk about business disruption, we're going to talk about entrepreneurship, platform business models, emerging technologies, and then finally your assignment that you will be doing after the end of this class. You'll have till the end of the day to do it and submit it on, on the Moodle platform. So how many of you have heard about the Gartner hype cycle? Anyone heard about it? No. So Gartner is a is a think tank. It's a it's a it's a company that always provides a, a, a kind of a vision on how technologies are evolving, how businesses are evolving, uh, and they have come up with a very interesting concept known as the hype cycle. What does it say that any time a new innovation is is coming to the market or is being launched? Uh, and we are living in times where we see, are seeing exponential growth of innovation, like right from the internet age onwards. I mean, we've had in innovations for 
centuries. Okay, we've had the steam engine, that was a big innovation. We had had industrial revolution. But now the digital revolution is going exponentially fast. So any new innovation, it starts with what you can call an innovation trigger. Okay, so you have some, some people, some inventors, innovators, or maybe someone in a lab, or, or they are introducing some new technologies. And then you have, uh, you have it rising, and then nobody notices it till it's, it starts going into the media. Maybe if it's an investable thing, a lot of investments flow into it. Uh, you can think of it as the dot-com bubble in 2000, when the internet was first coming, there was a huge boom in the American stock market in the New York Stock Exchange. And you see lots of companies, they put a dot com in front of their names and they started getting lots of investment, right? Everyone started betting on them that internet is the big thing. Then the bubble crashed and then everyone said internet is dead, internet has no use, the internet is not going to be, it's, it's going to be like a glorified fax machine. It, Paul Kruger was a, he's a Nobel Prize winning economist great in economics, but he predicted that the internet would have actually no use. And then after 2000, the year 2000, when the dot-com bubble crashed, we, uh, we saw the slow growth of these companies. Amazon started growing, Facebook, social media, mobile apps developed. So, then we, so what happens in a typical innovation? You have a huge hype. Then you have a lot of expectation, but then you don't see products really come into the market. Then these technologies start dying out. Okay, so, so that's called the trough of disillusionment. Everyone is disillusioned. They said the technology is no, no, no good. And then uh, there are some use cases that are developing, and then when they slowly start coming to the market, you, they see a slope of en enti uh, enlightenment. And then finally, when they mature, you re reach the plateau of productivity. You see these, these innovations in our daily lives. So everything from smartphones, internet technologies, social media, everything you can say has that plateau. Now, this, uh, this particular, so they produce hype cycles for different, different technologies, but this is all about artificial intelligence. And I know that's something you're using a lot uh, in, in your coursework also. So. Uh, where are we in the hype cycle of our AI? According to them, computer vision, it's very mature. It's seen plateau of productivity. Why? Because you're using it everywhere. You, you're doing image recognition in, in, your, in your fingerprints uh, of your phone. You're applying it in security cameras. You're applying it in footages. You're applying it. Uh, basically, uh, computer vision in industries, lots of industrial applications, you're seeing that reach there. Then you have autonomous vehicles that are now emerging, they are getting growing, so you can see them on the market. But then there are other AI technologies like generative AI. We see a lot of hype now. Okay, uh, chat GPT is there, it's great, it's cool if you can, can use it. But I believe that we haven't even begun to see the real applications because these real applications on the basis of chat GPT uh, that, that, that everyone is now playing with it, you are going to see a whole new generation of startups develop using that kind of technology at the back end, like generative AI. It probably will go through a trough of disillusionment. We have um, blockchains, cryptocurrencies had that had that they have been going through their trough of disillusionment. There are a lot of technologies that are out there that were hyped up in the past. Now they are kind of dead and then you'll see real adoption. So this cycle is very important for you to keep in mind as a digital entrepreneur or as a potential digital entrepreneur. Next, uh, how many of you know what this is? Okay, I have one. you have one. Wow, great. Your name, please? Adriana. Adriana. So, Adriana, and you have also? I, I am selling uh, a few. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, if you want to buy? <laughs> Are you into retro business? Uh, kind of. Okay. Good, good, good. But, uh, but you know, back in uh, my days, you're probably much younger. What's your age? 25. 25. Uh, anyone elder than 25 in this class? I want to see what's that. Yeah, you. 
<laughs> not us. Uh, we are not. We are from a different generation. <laughs> so, 24, 25. Okay. So at least, uh, yeah, I am. Uh, you are like 15 years younger to me. Okay. Uh, and these were so common when I was a child. Uh, I used to be so enthusiastic about buying a camera, taking a reel, and you would get 36 shots in the camera. Right, so when we went on a trip, my family just bought me one, so I had 36 shots. I have to be very careful where I go and take this, take the picture. And uh, for Kodak, this was an amazing cash cow. You could see it's a, it's a hugely profitable business. Anyone wants to share anything? You can say. Do you want to share something? We'll just share your thoughts. Yeah, we are nostalgic about that. We are yes. we to come back. But but look at the the business that Kodak was doing. It, it was selling cameras. Okay, a few other companies were also selling cameras. But then it was selling you the films. Okay, and then it was selling the chemicals for the development of the films to the to the shops who had the licenses to develop uh, the films. And this whole industry was being controlled by Kodak. So it was like the, the great uh, photography industry. And what they, of course, they didn't see that digital cameras was, uh, was coming. And how, how many, you know, of you, have you heard of Steven Sassen? Okay, in 1975, he created the first handheld digital camera. You can see how clunky it looks. It, uh, it was, the resolution was not good, it was like uh, uh, not, not very nice, but he created the first digital camera. And do you know where was he working? Kodak. He was an engineer in Kodak. And what did Kodak do with his innovation? They chucked it because they said that, um, oh, uh, the resolution is very bad, the quality is not good. But uh, other than that, the timing was also night right, right? Because you have to also get the timing right. You can be in the hype cycle, you can be too early, very, very early. Uh, why? Because people didn't have computers at home. There was no smartphones at home. How are people going to see? Even if they carry a camera and take a digital photo, uh, they said it's not going to have mass adoption. So they completely chucked the technology aside. And, but the second big reason is, when these, when these smartphones, not smartphones, sorry, when digital cameras started emerging, Kodak didn't want to jeopardize their existing business model. Right? Kodak, Kodak is, is earning from the whole industry. Why would it want to promote an alternative technology where it just sells camera? Right now it can sell reels, it can sell... It, it, you sell a camera once and then you never make a sell again. You sell... a. Uh, 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 one of these devices, you're going to sell reels, you're going to sell photo equipment, you're going to keep making money. So that is why companies uh, who are already established players can never innovate, or at least not innovate so fast. That's why it takes a complete different DNA in a company to have the culture of innovating, because when the company grows very big, uh, it fails to innovate. And that's why companies like Google, Apple, they have Try to build a completely different culture so that you have independent teams, they are working as startups within the company because for startups it's much easier to innovate, you're very agile and that's why we talk a lot about entrepreneurship. So another case study, Kevin Systrom in 2010 founded Instagram. What did he see? The mobile phones are there, people are taking pictures, but People are taking pictures and just keeping it for themselves or showing it to their family. They are not uh, yet sharing them in a mass scale with everyone. Okay. Ten years ago, uh, suppose in around 2000, I think if this, was a, this innovation would have come, it would have died. Why? Because it would be preposterous for me to share my photos with the world. It's a question of my privacy. Why would I want to share my photos with strangers? The culture was not yet there. Okay. 
throughout this internet era our culture started changing people started getting more open the notion of privacy started changing and people wanted to share their photos now by this time and he captured that and for him to build this instagram was much easier because it was based on existing technology that was already out there it was smartphones were there digital cameras were there cameras and smartphones were there all he needed to do was write a few lines of code but he could get a lot of success he founded the company in 2010 he sold it in 2012 for 1 billion dollars so okay very very fast tell us uh airbnb you all heard about it but again it's a question of the right timing okay airbnb uh, was launched in which year and even what can guess that okay give me a range how many of you think it's uh before 2010 and how many how many think it's after 2010 after okay how many think it's before 2010 okay so it was in 2000 uh, 2008 so, yeah so uh, so so What, what 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 was the right timing there? R- the right timing was that social media was just coming around. Couchsurfing was a platform that had already like kind of uh, it's been there in the market. People were going uh, and traveling, and uh, for free they were staying, and people were actually letting strangers in to come and stay at their home because uh, people very very curious to meet people from other countries. So they. So couch surfing was growing. This trend was growing. That oh, you can rent a room in your house, and Airbnb saw that opportunity. Of course, it took them few years to to actually get that culture going. But uh, now they have a huge business without making any investments in any real estate or property or hotels. So this platform business model started emerging. and we've seen the exponential growth of platforms because they first started with a simple web based way that you are connecting to two parties who have something to share started with the sharing economy but now platforms are including all kinds of new technologies you have phones you have devices you have iot you have industrial platforms so platform as a business model is has been growing and emerging all these years what happens with big companies when uh, they put a lot of r&d budget uh, but they don't always succeed so you heard of google glass right which year was it launched in okay 2000 very good very good close 2013 2013 they launched the google glass and uh, and it failed they for two years they were trying to test it sell it uh, it failed because the market was not ready the applications were not ready even today virtual reality and augmented reality are still not there you can play games i i just bought a recently a uh, 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 vr headset and i was very impressed with the quality i was very impressed with the applications that are now coming out there and i could see a whole new potential which is what you one of the things you can explore in your exercise but still it's not a fully mature technology but that time walking on the streets with a augmented reality glass okay the idea is cool interesting fascinating but what do we do we don't even have that level of ai to provide that kind of assistance ai assistant services that may develop in the future so it might be so timing is right very important okay so let's analyze one more company okay you, because you're going to build your own company at the end so i'm already revealing the the task at hand but let's analyze google which is one of the the largest uh, company what is google's business model or what was the first product google launched around 2000 year 2000 was uh, when google came before google Uh, probably professor afshin remembers there were other search engines right yeah, yahoo uh, was the dominant 
mostly. Mm -hmm. And we had also one another that was uh, at that time very important, but... Alta Vista, Alta Vista, yeah. Alta Vista Ask Jeeves. Yeah. There were several of them competing. And what Google got right was the created that page rank algorithm. So that means uh, instead of crawling for how many words they are and matching words with what you search for, they said that le how many hyperlinks is one site connected to, to the other. So similar way how, how academics find citation scores and all, that how many papers cite each other. So how many sites are having links to other sites. So this was their page rank algorithm. So they got the search engine right. But uh, they had a very, very interesting business model, which is what got them to succeed. What was that? Anyone to take a guess? Ads. Ads. Ads, yeah. So how does Google Ads work? Can you elaborate a little? So you do a search on Google mm -hmm. and uh, they will have these searches, they will get the information and mm -hmm. try to find the best <coughs> best ads directly to you. Yes. Okay. So 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 what Google does, yes, when you go to their search engines. It, it knows your profile. Because it knows your profile, it knows your past searches, it knows you very well. It can connect ads which have the high probability for you to uh, to click on them. Right. But, yeah. If you have a website, you can support that this is some keywords. Yeah. And what for your website to be up there in the search? Uh, that is search engine optimization. Mm -hmm. I, 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 yeah, so, so you cannot purchase your, your website to be up in the search results because that would defeat the Google's level of accuracy because the one paying more will be appear first. You can of course make an ad with Google, but uh, they have this uh, page rank algorithm which basically depends on how much is the site cited, how much is its footfall, how much is its traffic and so on. So they have certain algorithms on that. But uh, the key, uh, so, so what they are doing is they are showing you targeted ad and they have to get that accuracy right. If they show you ads and you don't click on them, the Google doesn't make mo money. Why? Because Google offers its clients an interface like what you can see here. This is the Google Ads interface for the clients of Google. So you can be, uh, I am providing a cleaning service here in, in, in Lisbon. So you can, you are providing this cleaning service. When you go and register your ad with Google, you can tell that I want it to be shown only in this area because my, my service is only in Lisbon region. So Google will do all kinds of targeting. You can do all of that setting. But then Google's algorithms know who has the highest probability of finding your, uh, or who's looking for a cleaning service. And Google will use those algorithms to show there. And secondly, it will charge you only if the person clicks on your ad. So this was a game changer because before that, all other advertisements, print advertisement, media advertisement, billboard advertisement, you had to actually go and uh, pay even if people uh, were not really interested. But right now you're paying only if they click on you, which means you're actually getting leads. So that's why Google uh, made it so successful for even small entrepreneurs, startups, anyone to target their ads so well that uh, that it's literally killed all kinds of advertising, even newspapers, everything it killed literally everything. That's why it got so so uh, profitable. But the second thing they did was that the AdSense now it's not only on Google search engine. If I am creating a website, I can put a little box in my website in the corner, tight with Google. I'm not going to decide which ads are shown. Google is going to decide which ads are going to be shown there. So basically any person, any website can have this Google ad on the corner of their page. And Google is earning revenue from literally almost any website in the world because they were the monopoly. So. Google was earning money. The more people use the internet, the more Google was earning. So this is this is uh, why it became a monopoly business model. And getting a monopoly business model with a strong moat, we're going to talk about that. This is a big challenge. 
and uh, another thing, when the smartphones came, you know the first one was the Apple, and the Google fun funded the Android operating system. It wanted it to be open source. It wanted all manufacturers to compete with putting the Android phone, and Google kept it uh, open source. Basically, you, without paying to Google, also someone, some manufacturer can have Android on them. Why? Because Google was not so much interested in the money from sales of the phones. Google was more interested in getting more and more users to use those smartphones so that they can get more data about you, so that they can target the advertising better. Whichever app you are using, you are using Google Maps, you are using whatever. So Google really, that's the whole business model around it. It's a very complex business model, very, very interesting. Uh, well, when the smartphone industry came, Nokia was the challenger. Why couldn't Nokia see it coming? Because Nokia had a, their own operating system and they didn't want to be just another... Uh, if, there is, if you want to speak, you can leave the class. Raise your hand and share with the class, okay? Don't, don't speak with that, that's Christian's love. Uh, so, what do you want to say? You, you remember this one, right? Uh, so, so my, my wife is actually there at the last row and she is working for Nokia. Yeah, but not the phone. Not the phone, the antenna. <laughs> <laughs> But this is Nokia and this is Blackberry, right? Both big giants, they couldn't see the disruption. They became the Kodaks of their time, right? So uh, you can see businesses failing and you can see uh, new business models emerging. Now the platform business model is interesting, right? Uh, you, you can have a platform like the Airbnb where you have buyers and sellers interacting but you uh, can also create if you can create an app store something like google play does then you create a product you create a development platform and then you allow developers to create multiple applications so the more applications are, are there out there the more interesting the product is so this is not only for smartphones this is for all kinds of devices you have virtual reality devices like Microsoft HoloLens, they have their app store. You have uh, Oculus from Facebook, they have their app store in, in the VR. Because any of these hardware devices become interesting when you have more applications on them. So that's a, another kind of a platform business model where you are incentivizing developers to develop apps on them. So uh, Facebook initially became very popular because it could allow people to create games and build games on top of on, on top of the Facebook platform right so uh, here we are let's discuss uh, some other so Airbnb we already discussed right but what is interesting about these platform business models right is something known as network effects do you know what's a, a network effect People interaction. Here, here I have a slide on network effect. You can read the definition of a network effect. The idea that when there are more users of a particular product, it benefits everyone else, and the product will become more useful. So uh, let let's see a simple thing. You are using a Lenovo laptop, right? Uh, your name, please. Okay. Does you buying and using a Lenovo laptop, does it help any other users of Lenovo laptop? It's a, I, I would say no. I would say no. So, because if you buy a Lenovo and someone has an Apple, you don't help him, he don't, doesn't help you. So it is a business without a network effect. Right? There is no network effect around there. Uh, but if I'm using Facebook, and you're using Facebook, there's a direct 
network effect out there because my use of Facebook actually means that there are more people for you to connect with. So if I'm using LinkedIn, so any of these platform business models, they have network effects, which is the core foundation of why digital based business models, they are so scalable and so sticky. They have a very strong moat. You, you know what's a moat? You, have, have you heard in business the concept of... You've, so moat is basically the, the, um, the water body around the castle. So you have a castle and you create this water body. In the, in the medieval times, that was uh, how castles were designed. Because if someone wants to attack, he had to cross the boat and that's very hard to cross because you would fire your cannons while people are trying to cross. So that's why all castles had a moat. So that's the whole concept of a moat is there. So if you're trying to build or design any business, you want to design it with a strong moat. And network effects are a very, very strong moat for any digital business because the more the number of users there are, the more useful the platform is for everyone. So which means if a new competitor starts a new platform, now he needs to start from scratch. And when the first users come to his platform, even if that platform is cheaper or better or whatever, it doesn't, you don't get the benefit of the network because your friends are not there, your collaborators are not there, your business partners are not there. So that platform will be very hard for them to compete. That's why you have a platform like Amazon, right? What does Amazon do? Connect buyers and sellers of goods, right? Uh, so that's like a two-sided network effect. You have more buyers on one side, you have more sellers on the other side. So when you go to a platform to look for something, you want to go to a platform where there are more sellers so that you have more competition, you can see more products, more variety. And when buyers want to go to a platform, they want to go to a platform where there are more uh, 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 sellers. And when sellers want to go, they want to go to a platform where there are more buyers because then they can sell their products more easily. So that's a two-sided network effect. Okay. So these network effects are, are very, very critical for all kinds of business models. This is the Airbnb business model. This is the Uber business model. All of them work with network effects. Well, you all know how Uber works. I'm not going into the details of this. Uh, one of the interesting tools when you create a business model is known as is the business model canvas. This allows you to analyze any company. It allows you because you can see here. So when you're wanting to create your business, there are two strong tools that I, I will show you. One is this business model canvas. How many of you have heard of this before or seen this before? A couple of them, yeah. Uh, probably if you've taken any kind of entrepreneurship course, it's very widely used. So you, you first see what is your value proposition. On the right side, you see who your clients are. So on the customer segment, you start to see whom am I selling to? What is the value that I'm providing to my clients? Okay. What are the channels through which I'm reaching, reaching out to my clients? Is it through mobile? Is it through web? Is it through any other kind of interface? Right? Uh, how do I maintain relationships with my client? What are my revenue streams? How am I charging my clients? So this is all on the right side of your business, which is your relationship with the client. You have another aspect of the business, which is how are you actually, how is your business operating? That's the left side. So that means who are your key partners in your business? You might be not making everything yourself. You may have suppliers, you may have collaborators, you may have service providers. What are the key resources that you need for your business? What are the key activities that you need to do? And what is your cost structure? So this is a, this is a typical business model used for more mature, analyzing more mature businesses. There is another, uh, another tool called as the Lean Canvas, which I will be now showing you. That is the one you're going to be using for your assignment, okay? Your, so your assignment is that you are working with credit risk models, right? Where, where is it used, credit risk modeling? 
Banks, insurance, any kind of financial company. Why? Because anyone who is taking a loan, whatever kind of loan, you are trying to see whether they are going to repay you or they are not going to repay you. What is the probability of default? This is what is what you are studying. This can be applied across many different uh, models and your challenge here is to build a business model for a new business, a new company uh, which, what, which needs to use any kind of a lending or borrowing based model and why this credit risk modeling becomes very important. So any AI based business, any business that is using AI and data as the core of their bread and butter, uh, they, they have a very similar, what, so what digital platforms you have what is known as the network effects. Okay, so that's why it's very, you, you can build a very strong moat using a network effect in a digital platform business. But when you combine that with AI, you get an even stronger moat. Why? Because if you are the big dominant player, you have more customers. The more customers you have, the more data collection you have. The more data collection you have, the better your algorithms can work. Right? Your, your algorithms will become smarter. Uh, and that improves your model, so your AI stack gets improved, so you can deliver better value. Because, let, let's give, take the example, you are a lending company, you, you now have profiled your clients. Now you have more people taking loans. You can see the default rate. You can see which profile of people are defaulting more. So your, with that data, your AI engine becomes smarter. Next time, when it's giving loans, it will do the prediction more accurately. That this person has a higher probability of default, this person has a lower probability of default. So now, there's a new entrant in the market. He doesn't have all that data. He doesn't have all that experience. His AI model is, is starting from scratch or is not so experienced. Whose model will work better? Obviously the dominant player and that's why AI in credit risk modeling business can be a very very strong mode for companies that are ready to use it correctly. So uh, I'll give you a case study. Uh, it's an Indian company called Bajaj Finance. Okay. This is its stock price. Okay, this is its stock price in uh, 2014. Uh, it was uh, 153 Indian rupees. Now, they, my Indian friends would probably have uh, be familiar with the company and be, be more uh, aware of this case study. It was 153 uh, rupees, Indian rupees, and its current price is around 7, 8,000 Indian rupees. And this was in a period from 2014 till 2024. Now, basically, so. It's not bitcoins, it's not uh, <laughs> speculative investment. Why this company grew at this rate? I mean, so you have to see and understand the demo demographics of an emerging market, which is very different than, um, uh, it, it's quite different than a, a mature market, uh, say in Europe. Or, you have a large class of people who, do, who are not, who, uh, who don't receive salaries, they are not salaried, they don't have uh, proper work contracts, they, uh, they are probably self-employed, they are running maybe a haircut saloon, a small trading business, buying and selling a small shop, uh, most of their accounts is not on, on paper and you had this huge class but they, a lot of them probably will default but a lot of them had the possibility to uh, to take loans and to uh, repay them because some of them have thriving businesses. But there are so many factors that uh, that determine if you want to model what is the credit risk of people who don't have uh, salaries, who don't have, you, you can look at variables that are not so common like for example, which is the location in the city where they have that shop, okay. If it's a little bit uptown, uh, upmarket area you probably know that that probably business is going well. Are they owning the shop or not? 
what has been their educational background, what has they been. There. So there are so many factors that goes into this kind of a profiling. But if you can do that, even in an unorganized sector, your algorithms for detecting can get better and better. So this is what Bajaj Finance did. It, it, is, uh, it is not a bank. Uh, what's the big difference between a bank and a non-banking lending company? Bank has a higher probability of default. Why? Because it has a lot of needs. You know, uh, you have and you lend the money. Well, that depends on how the bank is lending the money. Whom it's lending? Like, to. If you compare it to an uh, insurance company, mm -hmm. an insurance company finances uh, the liability by itself. Okay. The bank get up to that. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm comparing about, I'm not talking about insurance company because that's a different business. I'm talking about a, a, a finance company versus a bank. Okay, both do lending, right? Yeah. In fact, I would say bank does even more because it usually does collateralized lending. You go for a home loan, your house is there, they will uh, sell off your house. Uh, now the banks are also doing credit cards and personal finance and all kinds of uh, but the big difference is that, that ba banks, well, they have certain advantages. That is uh, because people can keep their money. So, they ha so you know, you, you have a source. Uh, lending is like you, you need to have an inflow of money and then you are lending it out, right? Uh, banks can uh, leverage themselves uh, sometimes because uh, if you are going and asking a loan from a bank, Bank can create new money and lend it out to you as long as they are maintaining their, their capital ratios. You cannot, a lending finance company cannot do that. You, they need to have some source of receiving money. Often, often they do that by, by providing interest to, to individual lenders or, or by selling their bonds and so on. And then taking it out and lending it to the market. Both banks and financial companies have to do this risk assessment and you can have good banks with uh, with good uh, loans the proportion of bad loans are very small because they've done their risk assessment very well and you can have risky banks but banks are more regulated by the central bank so they have lots more rules and regulations to follow that's why sometimes uh, non-banking companies can be very agile but they but the issue here is this is this wasn't a bank and its profit growth and profitability and so on made it exceed like uh, most of the banks in, in, in the Indian space, uh, this Bajaj Finance. Uh, and what they did was basically applied AI very, very efficiently and did that profiling of the unorganized sector. So uh, they, they had this, uh, well, uh, financing of consumer products so they had all these tie-ups with manufacturers and uh, and they, they could provide this consumer finance but what was interesting is they have this whole fully digitalized and uh, and app so they they are collecting a way more data probably in europe you might even not be allowed to do do that kind of data collection but the interesting thing is that model can give you 30 seconds loan approval. So you, you go, you give your uh, ID details and so on, and they have profiled you. They know what is your location, their algorithms know where you lived, they, they know a lot more about you. And uh, so they, they have profiled you and their algorithms will in 30 seconds not only give you a loan approval but also tell you what interest rates your loans will be. So that can be also a differentiator. The algorithm can actually give a lower interest rate loan to a potentially better client than someone who is going to be more risky. So you have a lot more uh, variables to play with to run a credit to business like this. Uh, this is uh, again. Uh, I wanted to look at the financials of the bank uh, of the of the of the company. So uh, you could say asset under management in 2008 was 2,400 um, 
and in 2002 it was uh, 197,000. So you could see this combined growth rate of around 37 percent. This is in um, it's in uh, crores of Indian. It's a it's an Indian currency. I'm not going to. Uh, focus upon how do you convert between crores and millions because that's a different uh, numerical system. But the I idea is that you have seen around a 37% uh, growth rate over these years. And you see uh, one of the interesting is non-performing assets, means bad loans, loans that are not repaid. They started with a 7% bad loan, went down to 0.8% in 2011 and has always been into small fractions throughout and this meant that the the ai platform is getting better and better at in terms of detecting bad loans you, it's, the idea here is for you to just look at this as a case study because you are now going to build your own case case studies another example in portugal is universal how many of you use using universal karton it's from it's by continent group they Sonai Group, yeah. Uh, so Sonai Group uh, provides you certain advantages. You can get, uh, if you, whatever you spend, you get 1% in continent spending points. So I use it a lot because I always get 1% cash back. Uh, but you can pay in three months and you, you have, you pay the interest. So they, it's a very interesting product here. Now, when you are building, your challenge is to build a completely new credit lending business models. You can, it's up to you what you want to do it with it. You have a lot more freedom in terms of designing your, your, your challenge. It can be something, you can design a lending platform. You can design a, a lending business for educational loans for productive purposes. You can design it for um, consumer finance. You can design it whatever you want. Key important aspects is, how are you make, making sure that the lending, the segment you are lending to, is it a productive lending or not? Because you can be lending to people and enticing them to keep on consuming uh, and they'll eventually get into bankruptcy. But there are productive lending, which means if you are lending to someone's education, most likely is he is going to increase his uh, income levels and probably give it back to you. Or if it is a productive capital investment. So this is something you need to consider. Do you want to focus on productive lending or do you want to focus on consumption? Consumption is also, there's nothing wrong with it. You just have to make sure that the person has enough capability to pay it back. Okay. Uh, you have to have an eff efficient AI engine for credit risk assessment. You have done your, you have now good theoretical understanding anyways from your course. But I want you to think more in terms of what would be their data acquisition model? How can you keep getting data from uh, so that you, you can build a strong mood around your business? Uh, so, which means uh, you have to, if you're planning to open that business in Europe, you also need to consider the GDPR regulations. How do you circumvent that? Because the thing is you have to get for every data you collect, you need to get consent from your uh, your your client. Maybe you can think of gamification strategies or, or or ways of giving some value to the client, so the client willingly says yes, you can take my data. That's that's the one of the challenge. And the interfaces. How do you use new kinds of interfaces to interact with your client? You have the apps. You have virtual reality sets. You have games, you have metaverses, you have so so you can think out of the box. You can be very out outlandish with this project. You can think what would be the uh, possibility for lending. Maybe five, ten years later, you can be futuristic in your approach. But you have to build a new business model. I just want to leave with you some case study, some food for thought. Raise, uh, so uh, Jose Maria Rego, he is my friend, he, he built this company, uh, it's a very popular lending platform company in Portugal. So uh, individuals, anyone can basically lend on the platform, uh, the, uh, the money is given for companies and then uh, of course the, the, the platform takes a certain percentage of the commission and uh, gives you the interest when, when and the platform has some 
uh, ratios uh, our platform basically has already algorithms in place to help you know with credit risk so these are some kind of business models that you can explore lending platforms uh, you can even look at the international stage the uh, this kiva kiva is a very interesting use case it's a peer to peer lending platform typically for people in developing countries who are running a business they need a loan so anyone can help give them loans and then get the return get returns on their money but if you are building an international lending platform because there's a going to be a huge scope for that you proper credit risk assessment and variables for that will be very interesting and because you're working in these kind of developing models you don't have so many constraints you don't have so many legal uh, constraints that you would if you were operating here so you can ca capture a lot more personal data but uh, you can uh, improve and and it will be helpful both to the communities there because they really need loans and a lot of uh, people in western countries want to have better interest rates because we don't have so much of investment opportunities here so it could be very interesting investment opportunities if you can get inspiration from kiva and build your own lending platform and see what how you could use better analytics and better ai on your platform uh, invoice discounting platform how many of you have heard of this invoice discounting so so this is another kind of a platform where for instance uh, you have a company that is selling a goods to a buyer but typically a company needs to make investment to make it gets the order from a buyer but it needs to make investments and it there's a time before which it can ship the goods and then get paid back so so many companies once they have the order from the client they are looking for loans to uh, to tide over that their their investments till the time they return uh, the, they get return on their investments so today there are institutions banks finance companies lending but there are also lending platforms emerging all over the world for invoice discounting where individuals can put their money across uh, by lending to different companies and these are again very interesting business models for for companies and then lending over virtual worlds well this is going to be a bit more futuristic uh, if you have looked at any of the metaverse goggles glasses i think that time is not so far when people will be will be working on the uh, over metaverses they will be getting educated over metaverses they will be sitting in a classroom like this they they'll be interacting so there will definitely be potential for uh borrowing lending all these things over metaverse you could you could probably think of such a scenario and build, build a business for that you can be creative as you want cryptocurrencies are an interesting phenomena uh you have of course all kinds of cryptocurrencies with volatile uh values which of course uh, makes them uh, sometimes difficult but then you have something known as stable coins uh which is like tether or usdc they are stable coins means they are tokens whose value doesn't fluctuate but then it's very easy to send and receive money across the world across jurisdictions so if you want to build a global lending platform maybe it could be based on cryptocurrencies we don't know how these cryptocurrencies will evolve which will die probably a lot of them will die but there there are definitely use cases that will emerge so your challenge here is you have the full day to to think with your group uh, come up with 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 a um, with a business model and fill the elements of this lean canvas so lean canvas is easier for starting a new business idea what is your unique value proposition who are your customers why you have a unfair advantage means what's your moat or how your your moat or your data acquisition engine will work what are your channels which interfaces will you use mobile app vr glasses computers physical presence what channels you will use what will be your revenue stream how will be you uh, you basically make money what will be your cost structure and basically what are the top problems for your 
customers that you are addressing and some key metrics so uh, what what uh, your uh, template ha has been shared with you okay uh, in that template uh, uh, can you can you just show them then i can just show uh, if i don't have possible to access that from so you can find these files on Moodle, okay? So please open your laptops, the Moodle page of the course, and you can find this file that is shared with you already, okay? So open the file that we have the activity for uh, 15 minutes to half an hour, okay? In the group board. Okay, so, so you, you need to think of a model. You, you, need, you, you can write a few lines for so each of them. Now, please listen now. Okay, don't talk, please. Yeah, now, I'm just explaining. Don't start the group work now. Yeah. After the uh, description, we can. So, first, you think of what kind of a business model you want to create with your uh, clients. And then, and you can just put these headings and, and write a few lines uh, under each of them so that basically you, you, you have filled up this canvas. And then there are four questions that I would uh, like you to, to elaborate. First one is develop all the elements of the Lean Canvas. That is uh, simple. Second thing is, are there any new possibilities for new interfaces for which to use, uh, with which you can reach to your clients? Are, are you incorporating them? It's not necessary to do them, but if you do, you can elaborate that. Thirdly is how do you acquire data for continuously optimizing your credit scoring model? What's your strategy for that? And fourth thing is how do you encourage your users to proactively share their data while at the same time still following GDPR guidelines and getting their consent and so on? What's your rough strategy for that? So uh, I think with this you can you can start your your work. Okay, so please start working on this canvas, okay? And we are here to help you if you have a question, if you have an idea that you want to check, that if your idea is working, it's good. So you already have the uh, Python program, the R program regarding to the grade the scoring, you know, to how to use the deep learning, all of these were uh, included in your project. So you have the platform already prepared. And as you could see, this is a trendy, uh, job that the people are establishing some uh, uh, fintechs, okay, regarding to the peer-to-peer -peer lending, and you can use all the things that you have now uh, to build your own business, okay. So think about it a little bit, uh, how to organize it uh, correctly that works for you, similar to the business that we can see they are emerging nowadays, right? So the idea is to think about how to migrate whatever you learn during these classes to the real businesses, okay? 